Today we are headed back to Spain with Napoleon. 54,000. Okay, so you're kind of screwed either way, apparently. Wait, what? Wow, that took me longer than it should have to work that one out. Hello everybody, Roger says hey. So a few Napoleon videos back, we were in Spain, the British came and tried to help out and that didn't go so well. But we're going back there, we're gonna see what's been going on since Napoleon left. There are actually a few battles in Spain that we didn't really do and I might have to go back and do those later, but hopefully this video will kind of catch us up on what's going on, or at least catch me up on what's going on, because I know a lot of you already know. And you also know that it's time for comment time. This is one of my favorite parts of the video where we go back to the previous video and I to see what you had to say about some of my questions and stuff. Now if you just want to go straight to the reaction and skip all of this, click the uh, reaction chapter down there. You can go watch it right now, but for the rest of us, we're going to have a discussion about Napoleon. Okay, so we had a discussion about uniforms of this era back in one of my previous videos, and there were some comments suggesting that the British wore red to kind of hide blood stains and stuff. Well, I was told by several of you that that was not right. Basically, the top comment referencing that was from Fox Danny, so I'm going to assume that he's probably correct with this. Uh, he says that they did not wear red to hide blood stains; they wore red because government officials chose red because it was the most cost efficient, and when red clashes with the red on their uniform it becomes black, making it very easy to see. So there would be no point in wearing red for that reason. So thank you Fox Danny for setting us straight on that. So I also had a question about why the heck did Napoleon not just go in and conquer Austria altogether? Why did he only take like little portions of it here or there? And Brody Le Francoy, I, I think that's a French pronunciation that I'm not sure how to say. Uh, why didn't Napoleon take all of Austria, as I had asked? And he gives me a four-part answer here, but he says that carving up parts of it to give to his allies, Napoleon's allies, is good politics. It also would have been really, really hard for Napoleon to have the resources to administrate all of Austria, so it would have been better for him to take part of it and hold that as punishment, because this also weakened Austria. Uh, he also implies that getting rid of the Austrian Emperor would have been bad because Russia was kind of allied with them. So in order to keep Russia from kind of like turning on him and becoming his enemy, he decided to kind of appease them by letting the Austrian Empire stay in place. And then he says, nine hour later, edit. I really appreciate you coming back and adding this last point nine hours later. He says, by Austria capitulating again and recognizing a binding treaty between them and France, this further legitimizes Napoleon's claim as leader of the French Empire. So all very good points. All of them do make sense. I'm getting like little flashes of Machiavelli's The Prince. I had to read that for one of my classes in college and it was one of my favorite books. I remember reading it. The strategy in that was just absolutely brilliant. I have a feeling that Napoleon is implementing some of those strategies by the descriptions of these points right here, but it's been a very long time since I've read it and I don't really remember everything in it. I'm just getting those vibes like Machiavellian vibes vibes from Napoleon. And I think Machiavelli came before Napoleon, right? Because I think Machiavelli was in the 1600s, if I re remember correctly. So did Napoleon read Machiavelli or study him or anything like that? Uh, Renzo with a zero says the standards are each regiment's colors or flags. Okay, they mentioned standards being captured along with the eagles in the last video and I wasn't sure what a standard was. I think I've heard that before, that the standards are flags, so that sounds vaguely familiar to me, but I just couldn't place it in the last video. A. Edward says Napoleon Napoleon's horse was named Marengo, and yes, there were some stories about him, like Thalus? Uh, mm, I don't know. With Alexander the Great. How do you say his horse's name? Alexander the Great's Book of Thalus. Uh, John South says, You will find Bernadette's later career fascinating, especially when he became a leading anti Napoleon figure. Okay, so we're gonna have one of Napoleon's marshals apparently turn on him at some point in the future. That's gonna be interesting to learn about. Skitofer. Um, hmm. My ancestor was captain in the 33rd Line Infantry Regiment Division Friant. I'm 
I apologize. I'm mispronouncing this stuff, I'm sure. Uh, Third Corps of Marshal DeVoe. He died for France at this battle. Interesting. Yeah, I always find it really, really cool when you can see what your ancestors were doing back in history and know that they were part of certain battles or different historical events. Uh, David Ty says, I've seen the skeleton of Marengo Napoleon's horse at the British Army Museum in London. That's actually really cool that they have that. If I make it over to the UK, I will have to make a point to go and see that at the British Army Museum. Ferret Yurduran says Chandler writes that Bernadette abandoned the village because he thought his position was vulnerable and wanted to close up with Eugene on his right and Messina on his left and thus shorten his line. Okay so basically he just made a really bad strategic decision at that point. Uh, he goes on to say it's important to note that Bernadette and Napoleon didn't like each other perhaps in part because he had married Napoleon's ex-fiance. Yeah. Um, a no marshal would have dared to make such a consequential move without consulting the emperor first. Okay, so he was in some hot water with Napoleon. Yeah, so it sounds like things started to go south with Bernadette and Napoleon right here at this point in history. I'm guessing it just kind of got worse and worse until Bernadette decided, you know what, I'm gonna be an anti-Napoleon leader. Uh, Daniela Stewart says Napoleon called his 12 pound filed cannon, the biggest at the time, his beautiful daughters. I know somebody else mentioned up here also, uh, Matthew Meek mentioned that Napoleon was an artillery man, so Napoleon liked his cannons apparently enough to call him his daughters. Well, there you go. And also, Daniela, thanks for watching. It's nice to see some women on here enjoying this as well. I know military history isn't typically a female topic of interest, but there are a few of us that enjoy it. Uh, Visco says, I just can't, can't, can't wait for your reaction to the Russian campaign. I don't know whether that's good or bad, if like it's a fun thing to learn about. I have heard some people mention the horses really kind of like have a bad time in Russia. <laughs> we'll see what happens in Russia. I just hear it's not good. Uh, Omar Bradley says, fun fact, during this battle, the Austrians used airsoft rifles and rocket artillery, first time in massive scale. You guys are gonna have to explain to me exactly what both of those are. I have heard of airsoft. I think that's like a big uh, game now that a lot of people go and play instead of paintball, they play like the airsoft. I'm not sure exactly how it works. What exactly, are, I guess they're, they're just shooting air at each other, but they can register hits and stuff. Stuff, so I'm not really sure how airsoft works. You're gonna have to explain that to me. I did not know that was a technology that existed like 200 years ago though. Also rocket artillery, we're not talking about rockets in the sense of like we know them today, do we? Was this a different sort of rocket or did that technology actually exist in the 1800s in some form? All right, so we're gonna leave it there with the comments. Once again, thanks so much for leaving them. Obviously, I can't read all of them here on the video, but I do look through all of them. They always help me learn and I think that they help everybody else who are watching these videos learn as well. I've seen some comments kind of thanking everybody for, you know, helping them learn. So it's much appreciated. All right, so I guess we're going to head back to Spain now. I feel like we really brushed over it quite a bit. The last time Napoleon was in Spain, he was having a really hard time kind of controlling the people there. The Brits tried to come in and help them out and it did not go well for the Brits. They had to escape. So I'm looking forward to seeing kind of the state of things in Spain at this point. What is Napoleon up against? What has he got to do here? Was Spain able to kind of hold him off or is Napoleon firmly in control of Spain or is he still having a hard time? So let's go ahead and get into it. Swore was my downfall. In 1809, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French, was at the height of his power. He had just won another crushing victory against Austria at Wagram, and imposed a humiliating peace treaty. But the war he'd started in Spain and Portugal, with his ill-judged invasion the previous year, continued to rage. Napoleon had placed his own brother, Joseph, on the Spanish throne, uniting a proud country against him. His troops had dealt ruthlessly with popular uprisings, while routing a succession of Spanish armies. In February 1809, Marshal Lann overcame the heroic defence of Zaragoza in a brutal siege that cost 54,000 Spanish lives and 10,000 French. 
but still, the Spanish and Portuguese remained defiant. And three months after their escape from Coruña, the British were back. In uh -oh. April, Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Lisbon to lead a small Anglo-Portuguese army. British redcoats would fight alongside Portuguese troops, who, with the help of British training, would soon prove themselves highly effective. Three weeks after arriving in Portugal, Wellesley moved against Marshal Soult's second corps, which had recently taken Porto. Soult and his troops, preoccupied with plundering the region, had no warning of the British advance, and were soon in headlong retreat, back through the mountains into Spain. Spain is a country where small enemies are defeated and large enemies starve. Having oh, secured Portugal. Starve. Spain is a country where small army... Why did I read that enemies? Small armies are defeated and large armies starve. Okay, so you're kind of screwed either way, apparently. Having secured Portugal for the time being, Wellesley planned a joint campaign with General Cuesta commanding the Spanish army of Extremadura. On the 10th of July, the two commanders met at Casas de Miravete to discuss strategy. Relations between these two allies were not straightforward. Spain and Britain had a long history of conflict. The Spanish were deeply suspicious of British intentions in Spain, while the British had a low opinion of the Spanish army, which they considered poorly trained and badly led. See, the things I don't get about the uniforms in this period is that they all look different. Like, I'm assuming that everybody who has a blue coat here is the Spanish, and everybody who has a red coat on, like these two guys on the side here, are British. Um, but why does everybody just have, like, a different uniform? Why don't they all match? That's always bugged me. Whenever I see, like, movies with older armies from this era. They have these sorts of uniforms and they never match. So are these like different ranks or was it just kind of one of those things where they didn't have their resources to make everybody kind of look the same so they kind of just used whatever they could get? It always bugs me. I'm a little OCD about some things and this might be one of the things like I want stuff to match. Also I'm really liking the paintings. I love this painting right here and the first one in this video that showed Napoleon on his, on his horse. I really like that painting as well. Wellesley's request to take over command of Spanish forces was rejected, but the generals agreed to a joint advance up the Tagus Valley towards Madrid, to be supported by General Venegas advancing from La Mancha. In the face of their advance, Marshal Victor's first corps withdrew to Talavera, where he was joined by King Joseph and General Sebastiani's fourth corps. The French plan was for Joseph's army to defend Madrid, while Marshal Soult led three corps down from the north to get behind and trap the Anglo-Spanish forces. Why is the king going down and fighting? I would think that he would want to stay and, you know, be the king. Or is he like Napoleon, sort of, and has this I have to do it myself attitude? Okay, let's see if this maneuver actually works, because I it looks like for a second that the uh, British and the Spanish were about to encircle the French, but now it might be the other way around. But Joseph, worried by Soult's slow progress and General Venegas's advance on Madrid, retreat, decided to attack at oh. Talavera. Never mind. 30,000 British troops some 150 leagues from the sea against 100,000 of the best troops in the world. Oh my god. Wait, what? 30,000 British troops, some 150 leagues in the sea. I don't know what that means. What does that mean, 150 leagues in the sea? Is that like a distance of some sort? Uh, against 100,000 of the best troops in the world. I don't understand this quote. Oh, wait, oh, wait. So he's saying that the British troops are are on land. There are 150 leagues from the sea, so they're not on the sea, they're not in their element, they're on land now against 100,000 of his troops. Got it. Wow, that took me longer than it should have to work that one out. The Battle of Talavera saw British infantry bear the brunt of the French assault. They stood firm, 
and repelled the enemy with disciplined musket fire and bayonet charges. Talavera was a small battle compared to the great clashes fought that year in Austria, but it proved that under Wellesley, Britain's small, well-drilled army was a force to be reckoned with, even though in the short term victory achieved little. Warned of Soult's approach from captured dispatches, the victorious Anglo-Spanish army retreated. While King Joseph and Fourth Corps marched against Venegas's army, which they smashed at the Battle of Almonacid. Okay, I was confused for a second who won the Battle of uh, Talavegra, was it? I guess I didn't follow who won that. It looks like the French did. The British put up a really good fight, and so the French are kind of like, oh, you guys are um, actually somewhat competent against us. Okay. That autumn, the Supreme Junta in Sevilla, free Spain's effective government, raised two new armies for another attempt to liberate Madrid, planning to converge on the capital from north and south. Oh, okay. But I am just now realizing that Spain has blue and red. <laughs> I'm just not the most observant person in the world. Uh, so the blue, I'm assuming, is French-controlled, the red is British and Spanish-controlled. But Wellesley, ennobled as Viscount Wellington for his victory at Talavera, had been so disgusted by the lack of Spanish cooperation that summer that he refused to risk his army. Hmm. Predictably, well. Spain's inexperienced armies met with disaster. Hmm. At Ocaña, they suffered their biggest defeat of the war, when a smaller force under Marshal Soult routed the Spanish army, taking 14,000 prisoners and 50 cannon. A week later, the army of the left was heavily defeated at Alba de Tormes. There was more bad news when Girona fell to the French after an epic seven-month siege. Wow, Spain. The Supreme Junta's plans to retake Madrid were in tatters, and southern Spain was now wide open to French attack. Should have gone with the British help there. Uh, this actually brings me to a question about Spain. Um, again, like Spain is not one of those countries that you hear too much about. Like They're not really the first country you think of when you think about military power. So was there ever a point where Spain was really considered like really formidable militarily? Or has like military just never really been one of Spain's fortes? We're in 1810 now. My object is not to obtain submission by force, but to dispel illusions. I will arrive at a union of hearts. In January 1810, King Joseph marched south with an army of 60,000 men. Spanish resistance evaporated. Spain's supreme junta was overthrown in a coup as Cordova and Sevilla fell without a fight. Joseph, who still hoped to win over the Spanish with his progressive reforms, was welcomed by many as a saviour from anarchy. Only Cadiz held out, its defences reinforced by a British naval squadron, and was besieged by Victor's First Corps. Meanwhile, Napoleon sent Marshal Massena to Spain with 65,000 reinforcements. He was reckoned one of Napoleon's best marshals, and had just been made Prince of Essling for his heroics in the recent war against Austria. Massena was to lead a third French invasion of Portugal, take Lisbon and chase the British back into the sea. He laid siege to Ciudad Rodrigo, a fortified city controlling one of the main routes into Portugal, which surrendered after two weeks' bombardment. Wellington, with only 33,000 men, to face Massena's 50,000, retreated. Mm. Massena crossed the Portuguese frontier and besieged Almeida. After just 13 hours of bombardment, a lucky French shot hit the Portuguese magazine. 70 tons of gunpowder went up in a devastating explosion that oh made all gosh. further resistance useless. It was a serious blow to Wellington, who'd been relying on Almeida's strong defences to buy him time. At Busaco, he found a strong defensive position, and made a stand. 
Massena's uphill frontal attack failed, at a cost of 4,000 casualties. But the next day, the French found a way to outflank well. God, I'm, I'm loving these paintings in this video. They're like really striking. Oh, wow, this is just crazy to look at. So we have obviously the British up top here firing down on the hill. So the French are at a disadvantage immediately. So I'm guessing the guy lifting the hat in the air is giving the orders maybe. And he's standing up there to get a good vantage point of the battlefield so he can give the proper commands. The guy in the green below him. Now I did learn about how maybe like the, was it the 95th rifles of the Brits used green or they wore green or something like that. Would that be this guy or is this some other uh, position? Again, it's like a different uniform. I don't really know what's going on here. But back behind the British, we have a line that looks like they're in maybe black or dark blue. Is that maybe Spain's soldiers? Also, this looks like a really pretty area. It reminds me of the northwest of the United States, kind of. I'd be interested to kind of look at what this looks like in real life. Casualties. But the next day, the French found a way to outflank Wellington's position, and his retreat continued. As Massena's army neared Lisbon, his scouts reported something completely Wait, unexpected. So the won that Wellington's battle? position. But the next day, the French found a way to outflank Wellington's position, oh. and his retreat continued. Wow. As Massena's army neared Lisbon, his scouts reported something completely unexpected. Stretching across the Lisbon Peninsula, protecting the city from attack, they found a new chain of fortifications in two major lines. Known as the Lines of Torres Vedras, the British and Portuguese had been constructing these defences for more than a year. Now the lines okay. bristled with more than a hundred forts, redoubts and batteries, manned oh, wow. by 30,000 troops and 250 guns. Massena soon discovered the lines were far too strong for him to attack. Interesting. What's more, a scorched earth strategy had stripped the surrounding countryside of anything that might help the French. While Portuguese partisans attacked French supply columns as they struggled through the mountains to reach Massena's army. Massena faced a grim predicament. Starved of supplies, too weak to attack, unwilling to, to retreat. Oh, no. But throughout this standoff, it was Portuguese peasants who suffered most of all. When their villages and farms were burned, many took refuge in Lisbon, where thousands died of starvation and disease. So, Prince of Essling, you are no longer, you are no longer Back in France, Napoleon had been preoccupied with his divorce from the Empress Josephine, and then a new marriage to Archduchess Marie Louise, daughter of the Emperor of Austria. She was now expecting their first child. Nevertheless, from Paris, Napoleon sent frequent orders to his marshals in Spain and Portugal, urging them to take more aggressive action. But when these orders arrived, weeks later, they were usually out of date and showed little understanding of the problems his marshals faced. He now ordered Soult, based in Andalusia, to go on the offensive to draw enemy forces away from Lisbon, so Massena could take the city. Soult laid siege to Badajoz, a fortified city that controlled the southern route into Portugal. When 12,000 men of the army of Extremadura marched to its relief, they were routed by Soult, after which the city tamely surrendered, giving up 8,000 prisoners and vast quantities of stores. I mean, Spain, you just, It was you another just heavy blow to Spain's armed forces. But remarkably, despite such disasters... And we have three different uniforms here. So I'm just kind of getting the sense that they're just grabbing whatever uniform they can at this point. Sorry I'm being obsessive about the uniforms, it's a dumb thing to really kind of get fixated on. Does ...and their many blundering generals. It was another heavy blow to Spain's armed forces. 
But remarkably, despite such disasters and their many blundering generals, the Spanish troops remained willing to fight, the courage of the rank and file undimmed. Victor's first corps, besieging Cadiz, had now been so weakened to support other operations that the Anglo-Spanish garrison decided to attack. The Allies landed along the coast to strike at the French siege lines from the rear. But they were ambushed by the French at Barossa. Despite heavy losses, the Anglo-Portuguese rearguard fought off the enemy, but a furious falling out between British commander Sir Thomas Graham and his Spanish counterpart General La Peña threw away any advantage. Soult, alarmed at these developments, marched back to Andalusia. Meanwhile, Massena, out of food and with no prospect of reinforcement, had no option but to retreat. Wellington's army pursued, discovering evidence of several appalling atrocities committed by the French against Portuguese villagers. There were running battles with the French rearguard, brilliantly commanded by Marshal Ney, until he was sacked by Massena for criticising his leadership. Having chased the French out of Portugal, Wellington besieged Almeida. Massena's army, now rested and reinforced, marched to its aid. The two armies clashed again at Fuentes de Onuro. In two days of heavy fighting, Massena failed to break through Wellington's position to relieve Almeida. The fortress fell the next week, but to Wellington's fury, British bungling allowed most of the French garrison to escape. Massena had lost 25,000 men in Portugal. Now he'd lost Almeida too, and a string of bad decisions not least to bring his mistress with him on campaign, had cost him the respect of his okay. officers. The Marshal, whom Napoleon had once nicknamed the Dear Child of Victory, was recalled to France in disgrace, never to hold senior command again. He's kind of handsome Napoleon guy. sent Marshal Marmont fly. to replace him. Meanwhile, Marshal Beresford, the British commander of Portugal's army, was sent to retake Badajoz, with 20,000 British and Portuguese troops. When Soult approached with a relief force, Beresford marched to meet him at Albuera. It was one of the bloodiest battles of the war, around 6,000 casualties on each side, with more than a third of the British infantry killed, wounded or captured. Marshal Soult declared, There is no beating these troops. In spite of their generals, I okay, always I thought they were bad soldiers. Now I'm sure of it. I had turned their right, pierced their center, and everywhere victory was mine. But they didn't know how to run. All right, I'm gonna have to go back and listen to that again. The accent threw me off. I was not expecting that. Is this the same guy talking? He's just like doing an accent now. All right. Assault declared. There is no beating these troops. In spite of their generals. I always thought they were bad soldiers. Now I'm sure of it. I had turned their right, pierced their center, and everywhere victory was mine. But they didn't know how to run. Soult had been checked, but he was determined to save Badajoz. The newly arrived Marshal Marmont marched to his aid, and they advanced again. This combined army forced the British to abandon the siege. But when Wellington withdrew to a strong defensive position across the Portuguese border, Soult and Marmont did not pursue. French commanders in Spain had learned grudging respect for Wellington and for the steadiness of his troops. For now, the war in Spain had entered stalemate. Once again, apparently. Spain generals, fortune officers ruined, soldiers, death. Prince Barracks While British, French, and Spanish armies crisscrossed Spain and Portugal, 
another war was fought every day, in the mountains, hills and woods. From 1808, Spanish and Portuguese civilians, militias and ex-soldiers began taking up arms against the hated French invader. They waged a war of ambushes and hit-and-run raids, known in Spanish as La Guerrilla, the Little War. Its fighters yeah. became known in English as guerrillas. Yeah, I had some of you guys in the comments on a couple of videos back and Napoleon explained this to me about the guerrilla. And of course I've heard of guerrilla warfare before, but I wasn't sure where the term came from. For some reason, for some stupid reason, I thought it referred to like actual guerrillas. Britain's Royal Navy supplied vital weapons, stores and money, often landing them behind enemy lines. Much of Spain's rugged countryside fell under the control of the guerrillas. North of Madrid, Juan Martín Diez, an ex-soldier known as El Empecinado, the stubborn, led a guerrilla band 6,000 strong. In Navarre, Esposimina, a former peasant, ran a highly organised band that caused havoc for the French, capturing convoys and couriers on the strategic burgos Bayon road and branding Viva Mina on the forehead of collaborators. While in the West, Julian Sanchez, known as El Charo, led the self-styled Lanceros de Castilla. El Charo himself wore a French hussar's cap, its eagle symbolically turned upside down. There were dozens more bands operating across Spain, though a few were no better than bandits, terrorising civilians as often as the enemy. The guerrilla war was merciless, marked by hideous atrocities on both sides. A French soldier's greatest fear was to be taken alive by the guerrillas, who often tortured their prisoners before killing them. Tens of thousands of French troops were tied down by this people's war, guarding outposts, or patrolling the countryside. The roads were so dangerous for French messengers that they required cavalry escorts of 200 men or more. Many still didn't get through, their valuable dispatches forwarded to Wellington, for whom they became an invaluable source of intelligence. The war in Spain would ultimately cost the lives of 240,000 French soldiers. As was typical in wars of this era, most died from disease. But more died fighting guerrillas than in battle against the British and Spanish armies. Hmm. However, it was the twin threat, a well-led regular army under Wellington and a popular insurgency, that left the French facing an impossible strategic dilemma. If their armies remained dispersed to fight the guerrillas, Wellington could attack. But if they concentrated to defeat Wellington in battle, huge swathes of the country would quickly fall to the guerrillas. Yeah. This was Napoleon's Vietnam, or his bleeding ulcer, as he called it. Not A well. war that cost his empire an average of 100 casualties every day, with little prospect of victory. And in 1812, as Napoleon launched his gigantic invasion of Russia, Wellington and the guerrillas launched their own offensive that would turn the war in Spain on its head. All right, well, there we are. This is our second video in Spain with Napoleon. So it looks like it ended about like the first video did, although it looks like France is quickly losing control of Spain at this point. And from the inferences in the last part of that video, I'm assuming that Napoleon is eventually going to get kicked out of Spain because it looks like it's an unwinnable situation and I hear bad things happen in Russia. I do know that he tried or did take Moscow but wasn't able to take Russia. I think things are really starting to go bad for him here. We're starting to see more and more resistance against him. It's getting harder and harder for him to win battles. Now ultimately I know that Napoleon is defeated and he gets exiled I believe to an island out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I also thought it was interesting. I just had this thought go in my head when he's talking about the 
guerrilla fighting of the Spanish populace, basically. It just had me, being an American, think of this is, I think, why Americans or a lot of Americans are so adamant about the Second Amendment and letting citizens be armed. You know, armed citizens and armed militia have a kind of a rich history here in the United States, and so that's why the Second Amendment is, like, such a big deal here. And so, like, watching this and watching the Spanish guerrillas and what they did against these standing armies and the fact that they killed more people than the actual standing armies, it just kind of made me think about that parallel that we have here in the United States, sort of. So another good video in this series, Roger and I are definitely enjoying this, right Roger? Also, if you enjoyed this video, make sure that you like and subscribe. I've also got all of my social media stuff posted in the pinned comment below and in the description if you're interested in any of that. So stay tuned for more Napoleon. We're going to definitely finish this series out on Epic History TV. We're going to do Napoleon's Marshals and maybe go back and do some of the battles that we did not get to. I also would like to kind of see more about the naval part of this war as well, even though I hear it's not quite as big. So anyway, that's it. Roger and I will see you next time. Thank you.